Our today's topic is welfare economics. Let's begin with the introduction. What do you mean by welfare? Welfare meaning satisfactory state, health, prosperity, well-being usually of a person or a society. In economics, we deal with person's utility or satisfaction which depends upon the quality and quantity of good or service possessed by him. Thus, in broad sense, welfare depends upon the satisfaction level of all its consumers. While the study of optimal allocation of resources and their effect on social welfare is known as welfare economics. The concept of social welfare function was propounded by A. Bergson in his article A Reformation of Certain Aspects of Welfare Economics in 1938. Prior to this, both classical as well as neoclassical economists has, has led the framework of the concept based on cardinal measurability of utility and interpersonal comparison. As per Pareto, social welfare can only be maximized if various marginal conditions of production, distribution and allocation of resources among products are satisfied. While Calder, Hicks, Skitowski, compensation principle gave a value-free objective criteria based on ordinal concept of utility. Here, we are going to discuss various concepts of welfare economics. Let us discuss social welfare function. A social welfare function is a function that ranks different social states as more or less desirable or even indifferent for every pair of social states. Concept of social welfare function is explained by various economists. Here we have taken few. First is the classical social welfare function. At first, social welfare function was put forward by Bentham, Pigou and Marshall. According to them, social welfare is the sum of cardinal utilities obtained by all members of a society. Mathematically, W is equals to U1 plus U2 plus and so on plus UN, where W denote social welfare and U1, U2, U3 and so on represents cardinal utilities of the individual members of the society. The main aim of the society is to maximize social welfare, that is, the aggregate of the utilities of the individuals of the society. In classical welfare function, as per further assumption, the law of diminishing marginal utility applies to money income. Hence, maximum social welfare can be achieved if income is so distributed that marginal utility of income is equal for all individuals in the society. Another assumption is that various individuals have the same taste and thus same capacity for satisfaction with the result that their utility functions are alike. Thus, according to classical welfare function, maximization of social welfare is achieved only with equal distribution of income. But the concept of classical welfare function is criticized by modern economists because as per them, utility is ordinal concept and cannot be measured cardinally. While ethical assumption of giving same weightage to all was also not accepted. Next is Pareto social welfare function. According to Pareto social welfare function, maximum social welfare is attained in an organization when one individual can be made better off without anyone being worse off. This social welfare function is known as Pareto optimality or economic efficiency. This was criticized on the basis that it is of limited operational significance because with reorganization and emergence of new economic policies, some people become better off and other worse off. Another is Bergson-Samuelson social welfare function. As per A. Bergson, in an ordinal index of society's welfare, social welfare is the function of utility levels of all individuals in the society. Thus, it can be represented as W is equals to the function of U1, U2, U3 up to and so on up to UN, where U1, U2, U3 etc. are utility index of individuals. Like in different curves, welfare functions can also have lower or higher levels. Movement along the social welfare curve makes the individual better off or worse off. Construction of social welfare function is quite difficult, but not impossible. It could be considered by comparing deservedness of two individuals or could also be constructed by considering democracy, that is through voting. 
Moving on to the next topic that is compensation criteria. As per Kelder's welfare function, if any change in the economic organization or policy makes some people better off and other worse off, then that change can increase social welfare only in case gainers could compensate the losers and still being better off. Professor Hicks supported Calder's view and together they framed the compensation principle which states that if A and B are two individuals and A is better off while B is worse off then in any case if A contributes to B for its betterment without losing anything then this criteria is known as compensation criteria. This can also be explained with the help of a diagram. Here in this diagram we can see that if we move downwards on the curve DE, utility of A increases and that of B decreases. While if we move upwards towards utility curve ED, utility of B increases and that of A decreases. Most of the economists believe that a movement is desirable only if one, no one is worse off and at least one person is better off. But practically speaking, most changes would result in a reduction of someone's utility until and unless some compensation is provided. Three important criteria on this discussion are, first is the Calder's criteria. Allocation A is socially preferable to B if those who gain from A could compensate the losers. Second is the Hicks criterion. Allocation A is socially preferable to B if those who would lose from A could not profitably bribe the gainers into not making the change from B to A. Third is the Skitovsky double criterion. Allocation of A is socially preferable if the gainers could bribe the losers into accepting the change and simultaneously the losers could not bribe the gainers into not making the change. This criterion implies interpersonal comparisons of utility which are expressed in terms of gains and losses of social welfare in monetary terms. The criterion assumes that gainers and losers truthfully reveals their gains and losses. This criterion fails if they do not reveal or either go for bargaining. Next topic of the session is welfare maximization. In welfare economics, we do not confine ourselves to individual welfare but go beyond that. An individual's welfare at any time is measured as the amount of satisfaction that he enjoys at that time. An individual always tries his best to maximize his satisfaction. An individual welfare is a function of so many economic and non-economic variables. As discussed, social welfare function is a combination of n number of utility functions. An envelope of these utility functions in a curve forms grand utility frontier. Each point on this curve represents an efficient allocation of resources that is it is Pareto efficient in factor allocation, production efficient and also consumption efficient. Thus point Z is the point where MRT is equals to MRS. To understand welfare maximization, here in this figure we can see social indifference curve is tangent to grand utility frontier at point Z. This point as discussed earlier is point of constraint place. Social welfare is maximum only at a point where both production efficiency and consumption efficiency coincides that is MRT is equals to MRS. Here MN is the grand utility frontier and curve I is a social indifference curve. Point Z is the point of constraint bliss thus social welfare is maximum at this point which is Z. To construct a social welfare function, society must make interpersonal comparisons of different utilities. So in order to get a social welfare function, society must compare the two individuals. For this purpose, a compensatory criterion is developed. By superimposing the social welfare function on grand utility frontier, we can determine the point of constraint bliss. Let us understand the concept of welfare maximization with the help of a diagram. In this figure, we can see that there are two utility indices A and B on X and Y axis respectively. A grand utility possibility curve VV dash is superimposed on social indifference curves representing social welfare functions to find unique optimum position of social welfare. In this diagram, there are four different social welfare curves 
W1, W2, W3 and W4 and a curve VV dash that is a grand utility possibility curve is seen which shows various combinations of utilities received by individuals A and B. The point E where the grand utility possibility curve is tangent to W3 which is the highest attainable social welfare function is called point of constraint bliss. Thus, from large number of Pareto optimum points on the grand utility possibility curve, we have unique optimum point E at which the social welfare is maximum. This point E shows both economic efficiency as well as equitable distribution made by the society. This point of constraint plus represents the unique pattern of production of goods, distribution of goods and combinations of factors employed to produce the goods. Moving on to the next topic that is envy, equity and fair allocation. Let's begin with envy. Envy, if in a given allocation of fixed number of goods between two individuals, if one prefers others bundle more than ours, then we can say that first person is envy of second. Another is equity. If in another allocation, preferences of all the individuals is indifferent of each other's choices, the allocation is said to be equitable. Next is fair allocation. Many economists try to define the concept of fairness. Fair allocation is that allocation which is both Pareto efficient and equitable. But practically fair allocation is just a subjective concept. As per the subjective theory of value, there is no objective measure of fairness and thus objective fairness is not possible. Fairness is a perception and differs from an individual. What is most preferred by one individual may not be preferred by another and vice versa. Let us take an example. Suppose there are three brothers A, B and C and their father gives them a ballpoint pen each of same brand but A prefers B's pen due to the color preference while B and C are happy with their allocations. This allocation is not fair as A is not happy with the allocation. Rather we can say A is envy of B. While in another case if A, B and C all are indifferent in their choices or we can say non-envious then the allocation is said to be equitable. Thus in the third case if the allocation is both Pareto efficient and equitable the allocation is said to be fair allocation. If any change in economic organization or policy makes some people better off and others worse off, then that change can increase social welfare only in case gainers could compensate the losers and still being better off. This is better explained in this diagram where there are trade-offs between envy and equity, equity and efficiency and efficiency and envy. Meaning that if an allocation is envy then it can never be equitable or if it is just efficient, it is not necessarily an equitable allocation. But if it is both, then only it is said to be a fair allocation. Moving forward to the next topic that is Arrow's conditions for social welfare. Professor Arrow has laid down five necessary conditions for social choices to satisfy in order to reflect the individual orderings. These are condition one is transitivity or consistency. Meaning suppose an alternative A is socially preferred to alternative B and alternative B is preferred to C then C will not be preferred by alternative A. Second condition is responsiveness to individual preferences meaning that social ranking must change in the same direction as with the choices of individual ranking. Third condition is non-imposition condition. It implies that if no individual in the society prefers alternative A to B and anyone or few of them prefers A to B, then the society must prefer alternative A to B. Condition 4 is non-dictatorship. It states that if A must not be socially preferred to B only because anyone of the individual in the society prefers A to B irrespective of the preferences of the others in the society. Condition 5 is independence of irrelevant alternatives, meaning that social preference of A over B depends only on individual preferences of just these two and not on any other alternatives which is immediately not relevant. 
all these five conditions reflects arrow value judgment and seems to be quite reasonable set of conditions for making social choices in a free democratic society. Thus, Arrow has revealed that it is impossible to make social welfare function on the basis of individual values that satisfy all the above conditions. Now let us discuss Arrow's impossibility theorem. After discussing social as well as individual value, Arrow proved his famous impossibility theorem. According to this theorem, if we exclude the possibility of interpersonal comparisons of utility, then the only method of passing through individual taste to social preferences which will be satisfactory and which will be defined for a wide range of sets of individual origin are either imposed or dictatorial. Thus, the only way to reach social choice is through voting, that is the majority rule. But Arrow has revealed that consistent social choices cannot be made without violating the consistency or transitivity condition. The social choice on the basis of majority rule may be inconsistent even if individual preferences are consistent. Thus, out of all those five conditions discussed earlier, social welfare function based on individual preferences cannot be constructed in case of more than two alternatives. Let us understand this theorem with the help of a table. In this table, there are three individuals who constitute the society have voted for three alternative social state X, Y and Z. The table of alternative choices. By writing three for most preferred, two for next preferred and one for least preferred alternative. Now looking into this table, we can see that choices of all three individuals are contradictory. Thus, Arrow has proved that it is impossible to construct a social welfare function based on all individual preferences without involving inconsistency or non-contradictory social ranking. Thus, he has derived three consequences in case of three alternatives X, Y and Z available to two individuals A and B. First is whenever the two individuals prefer x to y then irrespective of any other alternative society will prefer x to y. Second is if every individual in a group's preference for x and y remains unchanged then the society's preference among them remains unchanged. Third is if individuals A and B have exactly conflicting choices then the society will be indifferent between x and y. Thus, in real life situation, Arrow has shown that social welfare function based on all individual preferences can never be constructed without violating at least one of these conditions. Now, let's summarize at the end. Today, we have discussed the concept of welfare in the society, social welfare function, welfare maximization, compensation criteria, envy, equity and fair allocation concept and the famous Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. Thank you.